My name is Rick Schaus. I am the co-author of the book Lee is Trapped and Must Be Taken, 11 Faithful Days After Gettysburg, July 4th through July 14th. The other co-author was is Tom Ryan, uh, who lives in Delaware and is rather on the elderly side and incapable of doing this kind of thing anymore, although he would love to. Anyway, I'd like to welcome you all this morning to this get-together of the authors and the readers. And hopefully many of you have read our book. I talked to somebody, I see a nod or two. Uh, we sure appreciate it if you have and would ask that you give it a shot. Uh, it was interesting to write and to research and we hopefully put out a lot of information that really hadn't been covered, which is unusual for a Gettysburg subject. But uh, that's part of the reason why we went in and, and ended up writing it. This little farmhouse served as General Meade's headquarters from the time he arrived early in the morning of the 2nd of July until the cannonade began just around one o'clock or so on the third. After that, he did no longer use this, was able to use this as his headquarters, and went across the street and then down to Baltimore Pike for the rest of the battle and prior to his departure um, in pursuit of General Lee. My guess is that General Meade did not get a good night's sleep the night of the second and the third. I think that's probably a true statement. Um, there was quite a lot of activity here on the second of July, a very critical nature to General Meade, and his day did not end until very late after he held a conference, a council of war, in this farmhouse where they stuffed in something like 13 generals and talked over what the strategy what they would do and that didn't break up until late and after that and at some point there was fighting over on Culp's Hill that evening in East Cemetery Hill <laughs> and Meade had some discussions with his officers so by the time he actually got I assume into a, one of his headquarters wagons to get some sleep it was also quite oppressive weather-wise I think he probably did not get much sleep and was not in the best of moods in the morning of the third dawn. When the morning of the third dawned, it dawned with artillery fire opened up by the batteries of the 12th Corps as part of General Slocum's effort to recapture some lost positions on Culp's Hill. That artillery bombardment corresponded with the Confederate artillery and the Confederate attack on Culp's Hill by General Johnson's forces. So for the next few hours, from dawn until somewhere around 11 o'clock, there was fighting, and you could hear a lot going on, over in the Culp's Hill area. So by about 11 o'clock, the Confederate effort to take Culp's Hill had failed and General Geary and General Williams had recaptured uh, the positions that had been lost in the evening before that. Now, one of the problems in following General Meade's activities on any of the three days of the battle, but on the third day, is the fact that there are a number of sources that relate what Meade did uh, primarily from his son's account which showed up in the Life and Letters, which was written by his son and edited by his grandson after his son passed away in the middle of writing it, of putting this book together, two volumes, <coughs> Life and Letters of George, General George Gordon Meade. Um, and many of the things that his son relates to General's activities on the third day are not supported, corroborated, by very many other sources. Some of Meade's activities he didn't mention, his son didn't mention, but other officers and men recalled just a few accounts, primarily just two, um, seeing General Lee on the third day, uh, General Meade on the third day. General Meade gave us the best account of his activities that day in a letter in 1869 to John Batchelder, who was the unofficial official historian of the battle. 
and it's in the Batchelder papers. If any of you have the Batchelder papers, um, in volume one, General Meade wrote a letter to Colonel Batchelder and explained his remembrance of what he did on the third day, and that even differs from his son's account. Okay, his son has him doing some things that he said he didn't do. Um, and part of the fact is that General Meade, when he was here and when the cannonade began on the 3rd, he was down to just a few staff officers and orderlies based on the fact that this was one of the points where the artillery fire was hitting, not the main line, in the rear of the line. And General Meade said that the cannonade over was hitting his headquarters. It did significant damage to this building. He ended up having to move across the street for a little while, and he replied and he said that it was just as bad there as it was here. So the accounts of General Meade's activities do vary, and as you read it, you kind of try to put together and come up with your own analysis of was he here, was he there, did he go here, did he go there. General officers who supposedly met with Meade made no mention of it in their accounts. General Howard is one of those. Reports don't mention meeting with the commanding officer, General Hunt, in his accounts of the three days. Doesn't mention uh, meeting with Meade on the third day. He mentions not being able to find him, but not actually finding him. So that is, that is a problem that you have when you're trying to analyze not just Meade, but a lot of other key figures. Where were they? When were they there? because it all fits into the devil is in the details. So, in the morning, apparently at some point after Meade got up, and I think the artillery fire, small arms fire, message traffic, would have probably got him up fairly early. There were a lot of messages. You go into the OR, a lot of message traffic in the morning. Most of it would have been dictated by Meade to either his chief of staff, General Butterfield, or Seth Williams, his AAG, Sergeant General who were the two guys that ran his headquarters. So there was a lot of that. So he also had time to write a note to his wife, letting her know how everything was going. Big battle day before his son. He always let her know, George is okay, I'm fine. Um, so in the morning, his activities, his son has him being on Culp Hill, directing traffic, directing the battle, and then writing with General Warren and General Hunt along the entire line to Little Round Top. Problem is, nobody seems to have seen him there during that time, and the amount of message traffic indicates that Meade must have spent a lot of time here, and Meade himself stated that he wanted to remain at his headquarters so he would be in constant, could be in constant communication with messengers and couriers who would have been sent to this headquarters if they had some kind of message for General Meade. So he himself said he wanted to remain here um, so he could get that message traffic and he was very reluctant even under the cannonade to leave this headquarters and eventually go over to General Slocum's headquarters on Powers Hill. Now every one of the headquarters of the Corps they had a what they would you would call a signal station they had signal officers that were in communication with various core, Little Round Top, Cemetery Ridge, Powers Hill. So if they were in line of sight, they could communicate by flag with those headquarters. So me did have some communication uh, with the various headquarters. And depending on the, the fog, the smoke uh, from the battle, he would be able to get message traffic. But he was concerned about having couriers being able to find him if he had a message from one of his corps commanders or something important. Now during sometime, I believe it was during the morning, General Hancock did not make it very clear, but General Meade met with General Hancock, whose headquarters was just over that way, 2nd Corps. Probably Hancock came to see Meade. And of note is what Hancock related to the committee in his testimony to the Committee of the Joint Conduct of the War. Hancock says, General Meade told me before the fight that if the enemy attacked me, he intended to put the 5th and 6th Corps on the enemy's flank. And then he went on to say, when the assault first commenced, I was on the extreme left of our line. 
As soon as I saw the skirmishers coming over the hill, I knew the assault was coming, and I followed it up to see where it was going to strike. And as I passed General Caldwell, General Caldwell was one of his division commanders who was in position in that direction after fighting on the second day. General Caldwell, who commanded the left division of the Second Corps, I told him this, if the enemy attacks you, stri strike further to your right. I want you to attack on their flank. Why I say this to you, you will find the 5th and the 6th Corps on your left. They will help you. He did not attack Meade. Or, I'm sorry, Caldwell did not attack on their flank. I do not know. Perhaps it would have been wise for him to do so, not to do so, because the 5th and the 6th Corps did not make the movement. So this is kind of critical to the third day's activities, is that... General Meade and General Hancock had discussed a counterattack. Meade had brought it up with Hancock. Hancock believed that would happen, and he actually instructed one of his division commanders that if the attack, when the attack, I'm sure Hancock expected it would be repulsed, when the attack was repulsed, General Caldwell should move right against the retreating Confederate force, because they would have been Pickett's men on what would have been the Confederate right, would have been very close to Caldwell's line. And that Caldwell should be attacking because he would be supported by two corps, which is what Meade told Hancock. That counterattack did not happen. And the main reason for the attack not happening is because Meade did not plan for it to happen. The Fifth Corps was in position, Little Round Top area, on the left, where it had fought, where... Meade possibly thought Lee would try again. The 6th Corps was all over the field. All over the field. There was no way you could get any single brigade <laughs> of the 6th Corps together under somebody to commence a counterattack. So the planning was not there. Plain and simple. Meade told Hancock, maybe just to get him out of the way, that he would counterattack and made no plans for it, so naturally it didn't happen. Meade would later say that he did ride to Little Round Top to organize a counterattack, but I'll get into that a little later, what he actually was doing, or said he had done, in a message to General Halleck. Regarding the Sixth Corps being all over the field, one of General Sedgwick's staff officers later wrote, we were in reserve which meant upon this occasion that the whole corps was divided and subdivided until the general, Sedgwick, commanding the 6th Corps, had not a man or gun under his command except a few orderlies. <laughs> <laughs> and if you read uh, Sedgwick's report and his testimony at the Joint Committee, he indicated that it was like he may as well go home. He didn't have anything to do at Gettysburg because his corps was <laughs> operationally command sent to various other parts of the field and Sedgwick did, really didn't have a corps under his command for the battle and he said so, as a matter of fact. Now again, Captain Meade said, Captain Meade, his son, was on the general's staff. Not uncommon uh, for a relative of a prominent general officer to have a family member. Uh, Howard had a brother. Um, Slocum had a relative that was a brother that was working in it. Meade's son was on his staff. Had not been on his staff for very long. Um, he, had, he had come from the 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry. So, again, neither Hunt nor General Warren mentioned riding anywhere on the morning of the 3rd with General Meade to inspect the position. General Gibbon, who commanded a division in the 2nd Corps, in this area of the ridge here, and who slept uh, the night of the 2nd and 3rd in a field uh, by the Fry, Fry Farm, which is next door to us, in one of his ambulance wagons with General Hancock and another general officer, I think General Newton, I'm not sure who the third one was. Um, sometime mid to about mid-morning, General um, Gibbon comes over to Meade's headquarters and sees Meade and says, boy, he doesn't look very good. No sleep, tough battle day before, the weather's not helpful. 
He said, General Meade, have you eaten breakfast? And Meade said, no, we hadn't. And he says, well, you need to, you know, he was, Meade, you, you need to get some breakfast. So why don't you come up to my headquarters? We're, we're cooking. I got my guys cooking breakfast. Actually, it was like brunch. And that would have been in that area, right over there. And Gibbon even said it was in, and Meade said, no, I have to be here to get messages and to be available. And Gibbon says, General, my headquarters was right there. You, it, and you, anybody can see that, and anybody coming can, you'll be over there, won't take long. And one of his, probably one of his enlisted folks that was on the staff, had appropriated a tough old rooster. And they cooked it up and made a stew. So he finally, Gibbon talked General Meade into having breakfast, and Meade went over in that way and partook of coffee and some of that old chicken stew that they made from that tough old bird. And then after that, General Gibbon and his staff, they sat around talking. Meade obviously came back to his headquarters to find out what was going on. And then in 1869, the 1869 letter from General Meade to Colonel Batchelder, who was not a colonel, but they seemed to call all these guys colonel. Batchelder was a guy. He was an artist, basically, not particularly a historian. But he did become the unofficial historian of the battle. <coughs> he wrote, Meade wrote that when the cannonade began, this seemed to be one of the focal points of where all the shells were landing. And they were tearing up the building and killing a great number of staff officers' horses who stayed, remained here after the battle in poor Mrs. Leister's yard, contaminated the well. She had to have that redug. But she didn't make money after the battle. She didn't get anything from the federal government, even though she claimed damages, which were considerable. She had to have the well redug, and she sold bones of the dead horses for fertilizer or whatever. That's yeah. how she survived yeah. after the battle. His staff said, General, we got to get out of here. There's shelling going on. We don't want you to get killed. And Meade, again, was still very hesitant to leave. And finally, they went. he went across the street to a barn, said there was still shelling going on, and they finally convinced him. He found out that General Slocum on Powers Hill had a signal officer and if he kept the signal officer, poor guy, here, then they could communicate. And anybody that needed to communicate with General Meade, the signal officer there, could con communicate with the signal <laughs> officer in Powers Hill. Well, that convinced Meade to go. Now, one of the things that I've always wondered about, and probably a lot of you have too if you've gone into this on the third day, why when the firing was coming from there, and indications were that some kind of attack was taking place because this is 150 confederate guns <laughs> that's a pretty good indicator something's happening why is general meade going in that direction and not that direction because cemetery ridge is right up here and once you get to the top of that hill you got a beautiful view of everything that was going on yet Meade decides i mean also somebody coming for me just have to go up there to find him Obviously, he's going to have this headquarters flag and at least a few orderlies and staff officers with him if they survive. Um, but Meade decided to take and make his headquarters, relocate his headquarters to Powers Hill. Okay. At some point during the cannonade, Chief of Staff General Butterfield was hit by a fragment of a spent shell in the chest and was put out of action. And eventually, he was replaced because... Uh, of the discomfort, the whatever, the pain that was caused by this. Uh, it wasn't anything serious, but General Meade himself wrote Butterfield and said, I was concerned that you had suffered some kind of internal injuries. And they actually found the shell fragment and his staff, whatever, Butterfield's guys, gave it to him as a gift. So Butterfield's chief staff's out of action. So Meade said that he rode just about the time the cannonade actually ended, he didn't know it was going to end, but about that time, he said he rode over to Powers Hill to Slocum's headquarters. Well, we have two artillery officers who were stationed on Cemetery Hill. 
that said that they actually met with General Meade during the cannonade. One said, didn't say specifically during the cannonade, the other one did, and based on the letters, the way they wrote about it, um, I'm making the assumption that the battery commander, Lieutenant Wheeler, saw Meade first, and that Major Osborne, who commanded the 11th Corps Artillery Brigade, saw him second. Lieutenant Wheeler, commanding the 13th New York Battery, uh, said, I will only mention a recontra which I had with General Meade on Friday afternoon. I was with my battery at the foot of the hill, waiting for orders and expecting to be called on to relieve one of our corps batteries. When an elderly major general with spectacles, looking a good deal like a Yale professor, <laughs> rode up and asked me if I had a full supply of ammunition. I told him that I had a full, as full a supply as I could get on the field, having been to the ammunition train with an order from Major Osborne, but without success. Whereupon he got excited and said, you must have ammunition. The country can't wait for Major Osborne or any other man. Go immediately to the artillery reserve and order General Tyler to send up a wagon load. <laughs> Who is this guy, right? <laughs> He's a major general, obviously outranks the lieutenant, but... <laughs> now, I might have told him that there was not a round of three-inch ammunition, his battery three-inch ordnance rifles, left in the artillery reserve, as I had been there myself shortly before. But something in his face warned me against answering back. So I put spurs to my horse and got around the corner of a wood where I stayed until he had left the premises and then came back to learn that that was General Meade himself. Major Thomas Osborne, who commanded the 11th Corps Artillery Brigade, also had a meeting with the general. Major Thomas Osborne, he wrote, his account says, while the, this fire on Cemetery Hill was at its very height, Wheeler didn't say that. Osborne does. And Wheeler actually worked for Osborne. It was one of Osborne's battery commanders. General Meade rode into the batteries at great speed, followed by two or three staff officers. As he came within hearing, he shouted, Where is Major Osborne? As he came near me, I answered him. He then shouted, apparently greatly excited, What are you drawing ammunition from the train for? I said that some of the ammunition chests were giving out. He then said, Don't you know that it is a violation of, the, of general orders and the Army regulations, not just one, both, and the Army regulations, to use up all your ammunition in battle? What? <laughs> yeah, somebody said, what? That's what I said when I, the first time years ago I read this thing. I replied that I had got given that no thought, and that General Hunt had directed me to draw what I might require from the ordnance train. He then said, what do you expect to do here? I replied that I was expected to hold the hill, and that I expected to do so, if the infantry would stand by me. To this he retorted, you cannot hold your men here. I replied, I will stay here, General, and so will my men. He then rode off with as great a speed as he had come. He gave me no orders. <laughs> now, Osborne kind of took this with a grain of salt and related after that that apparently Meade's conduct in the battle, his organization fighting the battle, was much better than his personal conduct when he was with Major Osborne, that his anxiety and his excitement had not affected his judgment for the three days of the battle. Hey, hey Rick, quick yeah. question. Um, would those people be on his route from here to Powers Hill? Would he have crossed by no, them? Powers Hill is just about directly that way. Okay, so... There is evidence that Meade expected <coughs> Cemetery Hill to be attacked again. It was attacked the night yeah. before. Um, and... There is some message traffic that indicates that they thought that Cemetery Hill would be attacked again. And Meade went there after the repulse of Pickett, Pettigrew, and Trimble. He went, he heard what he thought was firing from Cemetery, and he went to see General Howard. 
General Howard didn't say anything about it, but Meade said that he went to see Howard um, after that. So I, my speculation is that Meade expected, he went to Cemetery Hill prior to going to Powers Hill because he thought something bad might be happening. And based on his excited nature and you can't hold here and what's going on and that, um, that kind of indicates that he thought something was going to happen on Cemetery Hill. Interesting. Never heard that side of him. And now maybe now the like Sickles controversy and all that maybe makes a little more sense because they were. Don't get me into that. Yeah. <laughs> One of the first <laughs> things. Draw some. One of the first things I did was try to get into Sickles. What yeah. went on? And it's very interesting. When yeah. was Osborne's um, re re recollection written? Good question. I have to check. I have the. He wrote a little thing about um, artillery fighting at Gettysburg, Level Corps, the papers of Thomas Osborne, uh, and I do have a copy that I got years and years and years ago. I will check to see what the date is on his recollections. Because I wonder if that's um, a, a little more exaggerated if it was written later, after the fact. Well, the major thing, of course, is that he remembered word for word. <laughs> and that, that's not uncommon. Word for word, what's said. Now, people say that when in certain times of stress and all that, they remember exactly what happened. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a good point. The later, usually, the later it was, the more expansive it got, and less like what you read about closer to the battle. That's yeah. why the orders and the OR reports and all that are really a good source, rather than somebody's post-war speculation. Had had, had had me gone to Power Hill during the cannonade, he would not have been out of harm's way because of the overshoot. They were landing, in fact, that's where the artillery reserve was in the Spangler farm. The shells were landing over there. Yeah, the artillery <laughs> reserve was down that way, and they actually, the George General Tyler, Tyler, Tyler actually evacuated it because there were a number of... Um, the, the Spangler barn had to be evacuated that, because uh, the, the shells were Hunt, landing there. Yeah, Hunt went looking for it, and when he went to where it had been, he <laughs> said that there he saw three exploded caissons, or limbers, and he finally was able to find General Tyler, where Tyler had moved to, to talk to Tyler about replacing batteries. In addition to the hospitals in the 11th state, yeah, the, the, the cannonade.